Hello, welcome to today's lesson. Uh, this is uh, an A-level PE uh, group class, uh, which will be streaming live and then available uh, within within our portals and within our, and within our, uh, in our channel for, for people to watch uh, whenever they want, uh, so they can you know, so they can study their, their A-level course uh, from the comfort of their own home or to or to share as a revision video. If you do want anything else like this, like lesson plans, powerpoints, worksheets, revision videos, quizzes, etc. Uh, then do head over to the peshoots.com and yeah, you'll be able to find things that you might be looking for. Uh, if not, then, well, never mind. Uh, well, today we are going to be looking at some sport and society. Uh, in particular, or well, in particularly, I should say, uh, we're going to be looking at the socio-cultural uh, factors of pre-industrial Britain. This area of, of A-level is, is often you know, split into pre-industry and then post-industry where we look at sort of the, the effect of, of the world wars and then into sort of modern day sport as we know. So today we are going to look a, uh, a, a very quickly at the pre-industrial side of things. It's probably take, uh, well, I anticipate about 30 minutes today, so a bit of a, bit of a short one, but we'll keep it short, snappy as often uh, this topic can be quite wordy. So hopefully we've been able to sort of condense some of these phrases and and topics down so that you just get the, the important nuggets that you will be needing. So we'll get straight into it. Uh, and before we go into sort of words, society, culture, I just want to start with a sort of a bigger macro view really as to some key dates and, and, and events on a timeline because there's there's a lot of things going on in in this whole time period so i think it's going to be important to get sort of a snapshot of sort of what's entailed in this in this section um, so we're going to start off by looking at this uh, at this bigger picture and um, we're going to start off pre-1780 uh, because pre-1780 is, is where we we are definitely in pre-industrial now that's very much um, you know, agricultural living, rural living, some small communities, urbanisation hasn't really kicked off. Uh, so there aren't really the big cities or, or towns or things like that. It's all very much village based, local based. Beyond 1780, that's when we do start to get into the Industrial Revolution and we get this idea of capitalism where businesses are growing, machinery is becoming more and more prevalent, and as such, it's almost like a honeypot. It brings everyone towards it because that's where the wealth is, that's where opportunity is. And as that happens and society starts to change and grow and develop you know, slightly different characteristics from what it was 50 to 100 years ago, as society changes, the sport that that society play also change. So we've always got this reflection between what is society doing, therefore what is sport doing. Now, sport is almost, there's a bit of a time lag in it, but as society develops and improves and changes its values and perspectives on, on living, sport and recreation also change. You know, so they change in line with how society is changing. So a couple of things, uh, we've got five key points, which they aren't necessarily you know, dates for your exam, but they, they help sort of paint the picture of how society does transition from pre-industry to modern day. So 1780, we do have the introduction of industry. 1850 marks sort of this, this middle point, this turning point of the first half of industry and then the second half of industry, where we've got participation in sport with more of a purpose. You know, there's there's more things attached to it aside from festivity, celebration, which is what it was like for the majority of people uh, in the first half of industry and, and beforehand. So this 1850 mark here, this, this Wenlock Olympic Games, it's, it's almost, it plants the seed for the masses to take on more organized versions of sport. And in fact, it does actually splinter off into what we now consider to be the modern Olympic Games. 1863, the FA, sort of Football Association. You know, obviously, the, the Premiership and the Champions League and the World Cup and the Euros, everything that's on TV and that we know about, it started 
back then, 1863. And that marked a, a key point in the, not, not just calendar, but in the timeline of everything. Because it signifies that sport is now rationalised. And rationalised is a fancy word of saying it becomes more standardised, it becomes more replicable, it becomes more, I don't want to say standard, uh, because it comes from standardised, but it's, it's followable. You know, everyone can pick up the rule book, read it, understand it, and then participate. It's more accessible. Yeah, it becomes this global thing rather than individualised uh, types of sport to, to, to one particular location. So there's no more variation in it. 1884, the female tennis. Um, that happened at Wimbledon for the first time. And that marked this, this new approach for women in sport. So that was a, that was a bit of a, a, a landmark or a milestone for female sport. And obviously in, it's taken a long time to, to even get to anywhere remotely near, near male sport. But in the last 30, 40, 50 years, there has been a huge transition from male-dominated sport to a more equal opportunity in sport very far from being matched yet uh, or at the moment but we're on that trajectory and this this date 1884 towards the end of the industrial revolution that that was that could, or potentially a seed you know a pivot point for that and then 1927 we've got the BBC coverage which marks a huge change in communication, in technology, in awareness, media, sponsorship, commercialization, all of these things that we'll study in post-industry and war and post-war and modern day sport, well it had its beginnings early 20th century, 1927 when mass media became a big thing. So in light of all of these dates we will have changing socio-cultural characteristics the society norms or the cultural beliefs and values they will shift and change and morph into what we now know as today's society and as those changes happen and as they shift from one period into another we're going to see almost a reflection a mirror image of the changing characteristics of sport so as society changes so too will the characteristics of sport and recreation. And we have those three large areas. We're going to be focusing on the purple today, pre-industry, so pre-industrial revolution, up to around this 1780 mark, which is then where migration, urbanisation, and this, this industrial revolution really started to, to kick in. So, pre-industrial. Let's have a little bigger there. So what, what broader categories can we actually can we talk about when not just with pre not with, not just with pre industry but these are almost the categories that change. So communication is the, the broad the broad item that could change. What was it like in pre industry time? We can do the same with transport, education, the lifestyle. You know, so back then, you know, pre seventeen eighty, very harsh, very Spartan. Very you know, hand to mouth, day by day, season by season. Whereas today, it's a lot more comfortable. It's a lot more luxurious. You know, people will have far more time, money, energy, safety, provision, access. All of these buzzwords surrounding sport and access to sport now. Back then, it wasn't even mentioned. The lifestyle was far different. Work. That's changed massively, not just in the type of work, but the, the rights around it. Hours worked, wage, safety. And then this idea of a feudal society, this clear divide of upper and lower and the gulf in between. Pre-industry, there wasn't really a middle class. You were either the servants or you were being served. It was one or the other. A couple of people at the top, and then everyone else on the bottom trying to make ends meet. And a couple of pictures, obviously, these, these will make more sense sort of as we go through, but just to give you an idea really of the, the kind of times we're talking about here. 
Now, there's no photos, obviously, because photography wasn't even around at this point, so we rely on, on paintings and pictures um, you know, drawn from you know, the people, people from back then. But you can just get this sense of remoteness, rural, small community, um, and yeah, it will definitely, definitely come across in, in, in what we look at uh, this lesson. So, we've got those six factors that we're going to look at in more detail. The first one I want to talk about is the sort of communication and transport. And, you know, the, the, the quality of communication and transport pre-industry, absent. It just wasn't there. There wasn't any. You know, we didn't have phone lines. We didn't have internet. You know, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't trains or high-speed trains or cars to get, to get the word out quickly. It would have been handwritten letters and it probably would have been horse messenger if you were sending a letter. But why would anyone be sending a letter that far, that far away? Because they wouldn't know anyone that far away because they can't communicate to anyone in you know, a, a, another village 100 miles away. So it was all very, very localised, which we'll look at in more detail in a moment. It was slow, expensive, and if it, because it was expensive, it was inaccessible for the majority of the population. I said just, just a moment ago about this feudal society. Upper class, lower class. For the lower class, which were you know, 80, 90, 95% of the population, they didn't have anywhere near enough money or knowledge or access to post. They couldn't afford it. So they definitely couldn't have, sp uh, couldn't have been speaking to someone in a different town to try and arrange a sport fixture. Wouldn't have happened. So now that we know what it was like, you know, the socio-cultural characteristics of the time, we can then start to look at the reflection of that in sport. What did this mean for sport? Local, irregular, unique. Competition was rare. So why was it local? Why was it irregular? Well, it was local because we didn't know we didn't know of anyone or any other sports beyond our region. The people from the village knew their village. They might have known the next neighbouring one because there might have been some you know sharing of trade there, or they might have travelled and, and and been there before. But other than that, they wouldn't have known people 100 miles away, 150, 200 miles away. They definitely wouldn't have known of anyone playing or a similar sport to them internationally. I just think about where sport is now. Obviously, I know that the, you know, the next 12 months is going to be a very strange time for sport, especially within sort of home learning, distance learning, um, and this whole sort of COVID-19 lockdown. But beyond that and normally we've got international competitions happening I, I dare i say every single day there is some form of international competition across a whole range of different sports back then we didn't even know where the next town was so we couldn't have played against them so how did this have a knock-on effect well it made them more irregular because if if, if you are going to play a sport and you might be playing someone in your local village we're well, not going to play them every single weekend because what's the point? That will get boring and tedious. So they became irregular. They only played when it suited them, you know, and when it when it was when it was sort of looked forward to, or it could be celebrated, which we'll get to in a moment. I've put down at the bottom there upper class use. So what I mean by this is that the people, you know, the top part of this feudal society, these these upper class people they could use communication and transport. They were already few and far between. There was probably one or two of them in each settlement. And they owned the settlement and basically everyone else who lived in it who served them. So they would have had to have been able to communicate and they could afford whatever primitive measures there were. They could afford to get in touch with the other wealthy people and then arrange to meet up and play whatever they wanted to. They might have organised a hunt and they might have organised real tennis matches, which we'll get to in a moment. But for the, for the, for the lay person, the, the normal person, inaccessible communication and transport. They didn't know anyone outside their bubble. Therefore, sport reflected this by being played locally, irregularly, and it was very unique. 
they played their sport, their competition, attuned to their environment and their people. They didn't really care about input from others. So, education, moving on, next characteristic. What was it like in pre-1780? Well, education was hard to find. You know, formal education was expensive, rare. As a result, the majority of people, the servants, the people working for this upper class, they were illiterate. They were probably trained from an early age into the family business. They were trained to work the land, to clean the property, to cook the food, to rear the cattle. And that was it. That was their life. Wake up, complete work, go to bed. Education beyond the manual tasks that they had to do didn't exist. And if anything, that kept that class divide there. That kept the lower class where they were because they, they didn't have the, not that they didn't have the cognitive capability, but they didn't have the opportunity to, you know, to expand their mind and skill set to perhaps rival or take on the upper class. It didn't work like that. Education was reserved for the, for the wealthy, for the upper class. So they could learn, they could study, they could develop their intellect. How is this reflected in sport? Or the, the masses played simple sports. They couldn't write down on a piece of paper their name, let alone a list of complex rules that everyone then had to try and read and understand. You know, that's quite a difficult skill to read something and to be able to conceptualise it. To actually see it happen in your mind while you're reading a piece of paper. Obviously reading a book is the same thing. You know, so I always say like a good, a good oh, a sign of a great book is when you're reading it, you're not seeing the words, you're seeing it play in your mind. You're, you're, you're perceiving, you're, you're, you're getting this mental image of what's going on. If, if someone hasn't read or they can't read or they don't read and write and not used to doing it, they won't be able to do that. They'll just see words on a page, lines on a piece of paper. So how do you actually tell someone how to play a sport? Well, you keep it simple. You keep it so you can do it via word of mouth. So bog standard instructions, simple goals, easy to understand. Whereas the upper class, they were literate. They could read, they could write, they could think, they could develop rules. They could adapt and build them until eventually they had this really complex game that they were proud of. If anything, it was, it was status. To be able to read and understand and add to the rules of a game and play it in, in good faith with someone else who was upper class. It was, all, it was all a game of sort of superiority. To become literate, to then be able to create a game, to then play that game and then beat someone with it. That was all about their status, their, their almost moral code and standing in society. So sports, we had these two different types. Simple, unruly, easy to understand. Or, if you were literate, they were complex and tactical. It required thought. You had to read the book, read the rules, understand it, and then apply it. Lifestyle. So next factor, that, next category even that changed from pre-1780 through to today, modern day. Lifestyles are changing. How was it back then? Well, there wasn't much law. As far as police went and the rules of society, it was pretty much self-governed. They had to make sure that you know, there, was, there was order, but it was probably up to the people who were you know, the most powerful, the most persuasive, the people who could actually control so it, it was a lot more, it was, it was unique. So village to village was different. It was whatever how that community got on, that was, the, that was the law of the land, really. Poor living conditions. And there would have been a lot of hand-to-mouth living. Work the land, rear the cattle, farm the food, and that's what you live on. That's your lifestyle. If something fails or someone threatens your productivity or your livelihood, violence would probably ensue. 
everyone was very much out for themselves in a sense of survival. Now, the flip side could be that, you know, when things were going well, there was this sense of community, a really strong local bond, because everyone had the, the collective aim of working, rearing, building the houses, and there was a lot more interdependence, because everyone was in the same boat, which led to a reflection in sport, which we'll get to in a moment. But life was hard. It wasn't easy. It was violence, power, strength, all of these things. These were big and important attributes because in a a dog-eat-dog world, so to speak, those were the traits that won. Those were the traits that put you ahead. If there was a a, a farm owner who needed a working hand, who are they going to pick? The person who can last all day and lift twice as much as your average person or the weak person who gets tired who can't carry their body weight. Simple decision. Go for the most efficient. And that, re- that was reflected in sport. So, you know, the, the attributes that were put on a pedestal of strength, power, control, persuasion, grit, pain or pain tolerance, that was reflected in their sport. The winner was often the one who was the strongest, the fastest, the quickest, who had the most endurance, who could tolerate the most pain, who was the most confident. Bare knuckle boxing, for example, mob football, which we'll get to in a moment. But sport was unruly. It was violent. It was physical. You know, blood sports. This was this was entertainment. And in in a life in a lifestyle where you know common day injuries and you know a little bit of blood, a little bit of hurt, that was normal. They needed the the extra violence and blood and anger and aggression. They needed everything extra to to make it the entertainment. If it didn't have that, then it would have just been bog standard. And it wouldn't have been engaging. For the upper class, obviously we have this feudal society, it was comfort. They had they had the options, they had you know they had choice, they had money, they could do whatever they wanted. They had time, money, resources. How they could then use that, well. They could make complex, they could make competitive sports. They could use purpose-built facilities. They could could design and then construct whatever equipment they thought they needed to play the sport they just invented. Work. So next factor, next category that changes from pre-industry through to, to modern day. People's work. What do they do today, nine till five, so to speak, but back then, what was it like? Well, it was seasonal. You can't really farm a land when it's frozen. So what do you do? Well, nothing. You wait until it thaws in the spring and the summer. As a result, well, money and resources and tradable goods, they were in short supply during off-season. Therefore, you know, money and wealth ebbed and flowed throughout the year as well. For the upper class, no issues. They didn't have to work, going back to what I just said. No, unlimited time, money and resources. Their sport reflected that. It took time. They could have gone for you know, a weekend hunt, a two-week hunt, using the expensive equipment, using horses. You know, they might have even played, or not, not played, paid you know, some working class people to carry their, to carry their, you know, their kill or their guns. Or their, you know, their bags doesn't matter. Whereas the the working class or the lower class, it had to be basic equipment. They couldn't afford to splash out on you know specifically designed equipment. It was what they could get their hands on. They used the spaces and resources in their village, local to them. Now going back to that idea of you know localized sport. They, 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 they made this sport around where they were living. When they were working, it was hard. It was round the clock, sunrise, sundown. You know, without electricity, they were working you know, to, 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 the, to the daylight. And if they knew that they had to get as much resources farmed or reared or whatever, grown or made, they had to get as many now, what's the phrase, uh, make hay while it shines. 
this is literally that phrase is for now. They had to make as much as they could when they could to offset the down periods. So they would have been shattered, no energy. All of their focus would have been on work. How did this reflect in sport? Infrequent. There wasn't regular sport because they didn't have regular time off. The time off that they did was probably holy days or celebrations, festivals. And when they did have this sporting fixture, it was a great thing. It was a one-off, maybe once, twice, three times a year, if that. So it was a big deal. So when they did have this celebration, there was alcohol, there was gambling, there was festivities and parties, and it was a whole community thing, mass participation. If we think about the phrases popular recreation and rational recreation, popular, you know, that sense, in that sense of the word, is it's, it's everyone likes doing it. You know, so so this, this period of time, because of the seasonal work, when there was a physical pastime, it was popular for everyone to do it. So popular recreation. Whereas the upper class, they began to rationalise things. They made rules and restrictions, guidelines. That's what rationalise means. So, we'll do a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is mob football. Now, this is the one relating to our lower class. Okay, mob football. And if we just think, if we just quickly think back about the work, about the lifestyle characteristics, about the educational characteristics, about the communication and transport characteristics. Is there one more? No. Here we go, there's the front page. Communication, transport, education, harsh lifestyle, working lifestyle, feudal society. If we now think about all of those categories and what we've spoken about, we can now put that into a real life example. Mob football. I've got two pictures here. This is back then. And the one on the right is a couple of years ago. Shrovetide in Derby, I think it's a place called Ashbourne. But they still play it. It's an annual tradition to play it. It's around Easter. Mob football, where it's normally one part of a town or one town or village versus another town or village. Aim to get the ball from the middle to back to your back to your end. That's it. Simple. One ball, get it back to your end. Think back to the education and the literacy. Is it simple? Yes. Do you have to have that written down? No. Is it going to be very civil? Probably not. It's going to be violent and unruly and bloody. It's going to be very physical, draining. That mimics what society was like at the time. So hopefully you can now see we've got a category that we can compare and, and we can observe how it changes from pre-industry to post-industry. And at that time, we can look at the factors of that category in that society at that time. And then we can look at how that impacts on the sport. So lack of communication meant that towns didn't know how other towns played any of their sport. Therefore, that town had a unique version of that event. Derbyshire, Ashbourne, Shrove Tide. It's their version. I think it's the uppers versus the downers. It's their version. Nowhere else in the world plays that type because they couldn't communicate that 100, 200, 300 years ago. Simple. There was alcohol involved. It was festivities. And it's based in a rural setting. Why? Because that was their resource. That's what they had. Their space. They had their fields. If we start to look at, and we will do, the changes that evolved from pre to, to industry, space, with urbanisation and migration, suddenly everyone became condensed into the, what we now know as cities. There's no longer space to safely play mob football. Now, I'm not saying mob football is safe, but if they were that packed in originally, would they have come up with this version of the game? Maybe not. Would have been too hard to do. No space for the game to flow. So mob football, simple, violent, happen in rural settings, 
And because of the festivities of it all, it was very physical. It was violent, lots of alcohol involved, gambling, betting, wagering. Because they only did it once or twice a year, seasonal, because of their work. So that was a look at the lower class example. An upper class example could be real tennis. So not like we know it today as lawn tennis. Real tennis has got its own, its own set of rules. And it was also called sport of kings. It was reserved for the upper class, reserved for the literate, reserved for the, the etiquette, the, the high social status people. Why? Well, because it was a complex, it's a complex game. It is still played. If you look at these two pictures, um, as far as I'm aware, this is in the same place, which is very interesting, where we've got this, this old version and this new version, and, the, and the, it's, it's transcended time. Now, I'm not saying the people playing there in the bottom right-hand picture are the upper class, the, the wealthy, the elite. You know, it, it's open to a lot more people now. But back then, to have a, a space designed specifically for recreation, that would have taken some serious money, some serious thought and planning would have gone into that, which we know was reflected in, in the society or so, uh, socio-cultural characteristics of having money, having time, having intelligence. They didn't play and you know, beat each other up with rackets. They played to outwit tactically, to try and get one up on the other person, but playing it in good faith, where there wasn't risk of injury or death or, or blood or violence or wagering or things like that. And because they were purpose-built f- uh, facilities, there had to be this element of travel. So thinking back to that characteristics of communication and travel, or transport even. Well, the upper class, they could afford to write to other people and say, look, I've just invented this game. Do you fancy coming down here, staying with me for a week or a couple of months? And then I can teach you it, and then you can go back and you can build your own. And then suddenly we've got this network of rich, wealthy people all playing a similar game because they're able to communicate and get these rules written down. I'm not saying they've rationalised it yet, but this was the first signs of sort of the codification of a sport. And lastly, we have pedestrianism, this, this coming together of the feudal society, where the upper class, they, they began to enjoy this contest, this competition that sport could provide, and the sort of the opportunity to have one over on their their peers. So what did they do? Well, they became patrons. Patrons is basically a fancy way of saying a sponsor or an owner. You know, think modern day how you have um, you know, people who own racehorses and they put them into events and then they run them. It was similar to that back then, but with people. So the wealthy owned or paid their servants or workers because they, they saw them as strong, fit, healthy. And they put them into these walking races. And there might have been some running involved, but a big one was walking. So not just pedestrians now, not, not just walking uh, for the sake of it, but it became an event. And what these patrons did, or these upper class people did, was they selected who they thought could win. They paid them some money probably gave them some time off. They put some money up as a prize, as an incentive to make all of the walkers, all of these working class walkers, want to go on this big walk. They put the prize money up, they put them on a track and they said go. Pedestrianism. So we've got this coming together of these two of these two classes, upper and lower, where the upper are funding and they have the They have the ability to think about creating something like this. They can put together an event where it's basically two two different competitions, upper class versus upper class, my walker versus your walker, let's have a bet, let's see who is more superior at picking the best worker. And there's also the competition between the walkers and and, and and the pedestrians. If I win, I get money and I can feed my family without having to work the land. So what can I do to, to maximise my chances of winning? I could go and practice. I could go and train. 
I might start to take this a little bit more seriously. I might give up working on the farm for some days so that I can go and practice the event that I'm going to be you know, competing in. So we have pedestrianism. So to bring it all back together now, I'm going to start or to finish where we started with this uh, timeline. And obviously we've looked at this purple end where the socio-cultural characteristics and development, the things that have the potential to improve or change or disappear, what were they like back then? Well, we had poor communication. We had a lack of transport. We had no education for the lower class. We had a harsh, spartan, very physical lifestyle where working was essential and that became seasonal. And then we had this generalized split, workers and then the rich. And because of this, we had these two separate sporting responses. Now this class divide led to what we just spoke about there, pedestrianism or patronism. We have patrons paying the workers to race for them so that they could benefit in their own version of competition. For the workers, sport was violent, seasonal, festival-like, with alcohol and wagering, and it was over a course of a couple of days. For example, mob football. And then for the upper class, money wasn't an issue. So it was expensive. Intellect wasn't an issue. They were complex. Transport and time wasn't an issue, therefore they were regular. They were far more civilised and they lived by a moral code, therefore there was etiquette and sportsmanlike conduct coming in. For example, real tennis. Now what we're going to finish on is... Oh, hold on. Where's it gone? There. It's a bit of a summary and then where we're heading next. So, socio-cultural factors, poor communication, lack of transport, no education, harsh, harsh lifestyle, working lifestyle, feudal society, how was that all reflected in sport or the popular recreation? There was this divide in sport. The working class, they were violent like in mob football, whereas the upper classes, they were expensive and complex, such as real tennis. And then pedestrianism came in when these two classes mixed in this form of competition where we had patrons providing the money and the intellect and the, the infrastructure behind these events. So that is pre-industry, that's that purple, that purple zone before 1780. Where next lesson is going to go is as we move into the Industrial Revolution, we see this, this rise, or not, not, not necessarily rise, because some things take a turn for the worse, but this change in the socio-cultural characteristics, how people live changes, how they work changes, their level of education and hygiene and health change. And as a result of all of those things changing, so too will sport. And that is where we'll be going next lesson. So I hope that was useful. That was socio-cultural influences on sport pre-industrial and a, more, or a close look at the things that we could use to characterise that period of time as a result of those uh, characteristics, what was sport like? And that is that. So if you did find it useful, then if you, if you want to like it or share this, uh, then do so. Um, if you're watching this in the, uh, in the portal, then obviously you can access the worksheets that go with it and these, and these lesson plans as well. Uh, for you to continue your revision as a student or uh, as, a, as a teacher as well. Uh, but yeah, any more information on things like this or group classes, then head over to thepeatutors.com and we'll be happy to help. See you soon.